So Tracy, I didn't ask you, did it stop raining in San Francisco? <laughs> Are we going to start that every time? Right. It's, uh, it's uh, as sunny as you can get in California. Well, it's beautiful. Where, where, where are you going to move, Mark? Well, if I move, I'm not going to go to California. I'll probably go to uh, Florida like everybody else. Avoid avoid state income taxes. <laughs> How's the uh, weather in New York? You know, it's uh, kind of typical January. It's overcast and a little cool. It's probably like 40 degrees, which is, you know, unusually warm. But it's uh, all, 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 all things considered, it's nice because there's no snow. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I haven't snowed in New York. No, we haven't had any. It's crazy. <laughs> Almost in the February. Yeah. So we'll start in about one minute. So firstly, we are live. So for those that are on the live broadcast, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm Mark Young from Bridgepoint Capital, and we have our esteemed guest, Tracy Lee, back for part two of what's been happening in crypto. And I won't go into the details yet because we're going to start in a minute. We're letting some more people log on. But um, a lot of things have been happening in the markets. I won't touch crypto yet, but clearly there's a sentiment change happening right now where the fear is being overwhelmed by the greed. And that's really the two pulls and pushes for investors, whether they're trying to earn money or preserve capital. And at the moment, we're in a fresh new year. It is the Chinese New Year. So there's a lot of things happening that are a fresh start, putting the misery of 2022 behind us, put that in the books. But Suffice it to say that was a really rough year, and the hope is that 2023 will be much better. So I, th I think we can start now. So again, everybody, welcome. I'm Mark Young with Bridgepoint Capital. We have Tracy Lee as our guest speaker today. We're delighted to have you on. This podcast will be about an hour. It's intended to be informal, with discussion-oriented, conversation-oriented, and primarily education-oriented. There's so many things happening in crypto right now. And Tracy is what I'll call the OG of the crypto world. She's got over four years of experience in it. So we're delighted to have her on. And I know she's gonna share a lot of keen insights with us. I'm gonna ask my colleague, Charles, who's in the background here to just go to the next slide. It's a standard disclaimer slide. We have to do this every time. So I'm doing it now. Basically this session is education oriented. It's not investment advice oriented. If you do get what we'll consider to be investment advice, run it by your investment advisors and financial professionals because our spirit, our intent is to educate. So that's the disclaimer slide. And Charles, if you'd be kind enough, go to the next slide. Okay, so you can see the lovely Tracy Lee and the ugly Mark Young. So Briefly on me, and then I'll throw it to Tracy to tell people her background. Uh, my experience starts with my current uh, position, which is the co-founder of Bridgepoint Capital. We're private equity slash late stage venture investors who like to invest in breakthrough technologies. Our value proposition with our investors and our portfolio companies, our value proposition is we'll bring these opportunities to the Asian market. Asia for us by definition is China and India. And many times we take these investments through Singapore, which I'll call the Switzerland of Asia, but that's a little bit about Bridgepoint Capital. Prior to that, I was with Catterton Partners. To those that don't know Catterton, they're a large consumer growth investment firm. And again, before that, it was McKinsey and Company, which I assume people know, and Morgan Stanley and Harvard Business School. So that's the Mark Young slash Bridgepoint Capital story. And more importantly, Tracy, would you be kind enough to share with the audience a little bit about your background? Yes. I mean, always thank you for the warm intro and welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, quick background on me. Uh, I'm the co-founder and managing partner of East Story Ventures. Uh, I basically started my career in Silicon Valley for the first 10 years working for different tech companies. 
uh, once was a you know startup founder <laughs> going through all the uh, uh, Silicon Valley right tech, tech, tech journey. Uh, around 20 late 2018, uh, I joined Coinbase, working on the institution side. Uh, later, I joined a smaller crypto custodian company called PolySign, uh, which was founded by one of Ripple's co-founders. Uh, and then fast forward, I joined Circle, which is the creator of USDC. Uh, I was working on building products using USDC, mainly, you know, with customers on their uh, payments use cases. Uh, so that's kind of like where, you know, my, my, my journey has become before I went to crypto investments. Uh, so pretty, pretty much on, on our fund itself, I have two other partners. Uh, one is Anthony DiMartino. He is a Wall Street veteran, you know, also an ex Coinbase. He was managing um, like a crypto hedge fund before. Uh, a third partner of us is Wendy Sun. She was an ex Goldman Sachs investment banker, also a private a private equity investor as well. So very quickly on our fund, we invest into seed, uh, pre seed, early stage Web three companies, Min mainly focused in two areas. One, we call them crypto payments, which we believe is going to be the next fintech revolution. Uh, the second category is uh, infrastructure. Uh, and we're, you know, our fund is raising $30 million right now. Um, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's a really, actually, it's a really good market to invest. <laughs> I think Mark and I probably will touch base on a little bit on the market condition. Um, but, uh, you know, that that's, what I'm working on right now. All right. Well, firstly, thank you, Tracy. And again, it's an honor to have you participate in our podcast. I did want to just, I'll say, discuss the market a little bit. And last podcast, we were saying how cryptos had a nice rally, depending on your perspective, it's the next bull run or a dead cat bounce, as Wall Street likes to refer to downtrodden assets that have had some improvement in their price. But either way, you can't deny the fact that crypto in the last 30 days is up. When I say crypto, I'm using Bitcoin as a proxy. So just allow me that freedom. But Bitcoin is up 37% in a month, which is extraordinary. For, so, for, for a Web2 web investor, it's uh, extraordinary <laughs> for us. You know, okay, that's fair. That, kind of normal. Not, yeah. not, not so normal, but yeah. So you combine the performance of Bitcoin, and it is the Chinese New Year. So I should have acknowledged that before we started, Tracy, but Happy New Year. And this is the year of the rabbit. But yeah. Thank you. what, from your perspective, is causing this significant rally in Bitcoin? And is it something that over the short run, at least, will sustain itself? Or when the Chinese come back from New Year's, they're going to go, wow, this is a good selling opportunity? Or No one knows, but yeah. what's your opinion? Well, I, I think I'll touch more on the crypto side of, of the environment and people's I mean, feelings in general. Um, I feel like for us, you know, we're just feeling tired <laughs> of this crypto winter, right? It's been... A much longer winter than the last two cycles. Um, you know, a lot of conversations towards end of last year, right after what FTX happened, have been always around. You know, what's going to happen with uh, Genesis? What's going to happen with DCG? Uh, it was always a conversation, right? Uh, me and my, my other crypto VC friends or founders um, just have been talking about this for months. So I think at this point, right, we saw what happened with uh, DCG. They're filing you know, bankruptcy. Right? But basically, is what we have been anticipating for months, and now finally this thing happened. Um, I think people are just really tired of, of you know, uh, uh, the bad press of the industry. Um, kind of the the the, the I, I will say slightly depressed people do FTX, right? I think people now are just really tired of this. Because I do see, in general, in, within the ecosystem and community, people are building, right? The believers are still moving forward. Uh, more applications are being built. Founders are 
still go out raise money, VCs are actually start to relax and deploy money. Right? In the last two years, many of the VCs that I have now have paused. But recently, after the new year, many of them have either told the you know the the the, the other VCs or portfolios um, they are going back to invest. So I think these are good signs just for, for crypto people in general. Um, and then another thing is I actually chatted uh, with my partner, Anthony. Right? He, he's a trader background. I think what we're seeing is we can sense the Fed is showing some signs of ending this tightening cycle. Right? We, we probably still have to wait for the Fed one, another interest rate you know, is coming out. Uh, but that's what we've been feeling, right, is, is people are just tired and being more optimistic. This recession is probably not that worse or maybe a mild one. Um, so so I guess that's just really from my perspective why I think there's a rally, right? Uh, and, and crypto people are very, very optimistic. Like We don't feel like this is going to be dragging for a year or two years. Many people I have chatted recently right we feel like by q3 or q4 we're gonna see the crypto rally you know again just just like the previous ones well when you say q3 q4 rally again i would argue 37 percent in a month is a rally <laughs> it is people are happy all my friends relatively are, are happy yeah with the results and i have i have to emphasize a point you made which was genesis and Digital Currency Group, DCG. I've been tracking markets for quite a while. And one of the things, well, two, two key takeaways, never fight the Fed because the Fed always wins. And secondly, watch how prices respond to market good news or bad news. And DCG going bankrupt is bad news. In spite of that headwind, the crypto market rallied, rallied a lot. So it tells me a couple of things. The market was underweight crypto. It was positioned on the short side, not the overweight long side. So it allowed this bad news to basically filter through the market unscathed for those that own crypto. And secondly, with the Fed the market at the moment, the consensus is 25 basis points, two more times, and then they stop. There's a lot of people that expect a recession in the second half of the year and the Fed starting to ease the second half of the year. That's what's being talked about right now. Will that happen? Who no one knows, but that's the sentiment. And that's, I call it the risk on positive environment. Risk on crypto is a risk on investment for many people. So all that combined has set the stage for this rally that we're going through right now. Exactly. I mean, I, I think in, in the past, right, we call them crypto winters. Um, this is a, considered to be the third one. The, in the recent ones, uh, there's never much of crypto price correlation with traditional equity market. Um, this is probably the closest one we've ever seen. And then, you know, it, so now the crypto has been correlated with this, you know, to this move, right, in, in risk assets. But now I think what we're seeing is there are signs, you know, the leverage has been severely reduced and people are just feeling, you know, <laughs> very much exhausted of selling, right? Especially for crypto. Uh, I will have to say, you know, the, the friends I've been talking with in the, in the, re in the last several months, many, many of the long-term believers never sold any of their crypto holdings, right? So I, I, most of them didn't sell in the peak market last year or, or beginning of the year. Uh, you know, people are, are slightly feeling, wow, why, why, why are we getting so greedy in a sense, right? <laughs> didn't sell. But many of them still, you know, they, they, they're just not trading. They're holding them for the long term. Um, I really think that's actually a majority of the sentiment from these crypto believers or early crypto people. Well, that's actually a key point. I'd like to triple underline, if I may. You have what I call the insiders, the quote unquote smart money, if I can call it that, that 
didn't sell that long-term maintain their bullish sentiment. And clearly, Tracy, I'll put you in the bullish sentiment category as well. That <laughs> I would I would be sitting here after so many years in crypto, right? Now being bullish on it. <laughs> yeah. And there's we'll get into this shortly, but there are applications now that could dramatically improve economic results in many industries and sectors and geographies. But we'll get to that shortly. But bottom line, the insiders in many cases are still bullish, held on, did not sell. I think those are important takeaways. Let's, if I may, let's just briefly talk about the current the current investment landscape. And you're in the private investment world, so you see private deals. You write investment checks to private companies, and you've been doing this for four years. So just for the audience's benefit, talk about the sentiment, the valuations, the market today versus 12, 18 months ago during peak bullish times. And what's what do you see as the, the changes today? Yeah, I mean, thanks for adding more years to my investment uh, experience. <laughs> so so I, I actually, right, we, we started doing investment was around late 2021, right? That was... Yep slightly considered to be the end of the bull market, the tail end. Um, so during that time, right, when we were small, just getting our name out there, uh, it was quite difficult to get good quality deals. You know, I have to say. Um, at the time, just there's so much money pouring into crypto companies. The valuations were extremely high at the point. Right? A lot of them is we have to go through close connections actually we have to prove the founder we have a value add that, that to me that was really ri ridiculous in a way that like i told I, I i talked to my friend it was the point that founders are interviewing vcs and asking vcs to compete with each other right show us you know what we can bring them onto the table and um, so i'll say back then you know i've, I've seen a lot of valuations seed round was about a hundred million. You know, it's 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 not abnormal. <laughs> In fact, one of my uh, ex Coinbase coworkers, he uh, he's a long term engineer there. Um, his startup they raised a ninety million post money valuation on seed. I, I mean, I have more story to tell there, but that was really the valuation across the board. We see a lot of them. Seed valuation 40, 50 million, It's it's a norm. Right. And then we're somehow lucky enough. We got into some very good deals, uh, backed by great, you know, great um, lead investors like Pantera or um, Generous Catalyst. The valuation we invest into were like ten million to fifteen million post money. Uh, I think par partially is I just didn't want to get into the hype, right? Because when you think about returns, seed is already a hundred mil. If they go to a, mil, a billion dollar valuation, right? That's that's only 10x. If I get into a 10 million round, a billion valuation, I'm getting a, you know, 10x. So it, for us at the time, it was like no brainer. We'd rather choose the quality deals to invest than just being hyped going into this really hot, you know, deals everybody was chasing. Um, and let's switch gears to, to today, right? The valuations, uh, we definitely have been seeing dropping dramatically. And most of the seed is around 10 to 20, I will say. Some of them are slightly higher if they, they are further along or it's a, it's a huge project. So for example, um, Epson layer ones uh, roughly have a slightly higher valuation. Let's say it's sitting around 40 million, it could be 50. Uh, but the normal crypto projects are usually 10 to 20. I would just add to that normal valuation of 10 to 20 for seed. Those are, I'll just say, reasonably close to seed round investments in VC in general. Yeah, there's always variances up and down, but they're within the bell curve of what is considered fair and reasonable for seed investments in VC. 
it, it is reasonable, yeah. But in a sense, you know, I guess from the crypto side is we're finally becoming normal. <laughs> we're not a hype anymore, you know. Um, and, and in fact, I am seeing some down rounds. I mean, they're happening already. The founders, you know, previously have raised higher valuations now for different reasons, right? Either to um, extend their runway or building products or, or you know, have to pay some services, they're raising. And in fact, um, we have a, a deal in the pipeline that I actually very, very much like the company. Uh, they're having a down round. The valuation is kind of half to what they have in the previous round. For me, it's like, wow, it's, just, you know, it's, 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 it's a much better investment environment and better valuation if, you know, if we get in now, right, versus several months ago. Well, if you talk about the down round just for a minute, clearly you're coming in at a cheaper price than last round. That's the definition of a down round. But also you're getting the benefit of that previous capital and I'll just say the value it created, right? That money was put to work. They did stuff with it and you're underwriting a deal in business you like. So you're kind of winning twice. You get the cheaper price and you get the benefit of the prior capital and what it did to create more value. Yeah, exactly. I actually think these founders, you know, are okay to accept that is they're learning a lesson as well uh right having higher valuation raising money just it's not always the best situation and in fact so i, I think in crypto right the founders uh dynamic many of the, them are still the first time founders i think that's number one number two is they're the first crypto builder which means they actually never have worked for a crypto company before or actually, you know, be heavily involved into a crypto project before. So we see a lot of those kind of dynamics. And it's, you know, I've heard from my my, my other VC friends' portfolio companies. Uh, it's such a hard pill to the, for, for these founders to swallow, right? Because they were not a serial founder, never done this before. You know, they raised high valuation. Now they're like, oh, I'm, I, I can only raise half or even one third of what I was being valued. It's taking a hit personally to them, right? <laughs> so I think we, 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 we shall have to see how these are being played out for especially these kind of founders, right? The smart ones, I think they will take you know, good investors' advice, do what it, whatever is the best for their business. Well, cl clearly down rounds or an ego blow to any founder. Nobody wants that. But you mentioned many of these founders, they're a first time founder, first time crypto, I'll just say entrepreneur, and they're learning some hard lessons. Mm -hmm. Finance in an early stage company is a marathon with no finish line, meaning yeah. they're gonna go out again, they'll go out again to raise more capital. If uh, Particularly if they're successful, I like to say growth eats cash. So depending on how they're doing, the odds are they'll have to raise more capital. So yeah, you always want to have flexibility in your fundraising. So if you raise valuations and capital at an unsustainable level, you go out again, it's a down round. It's almost like a falling knife. Where does it stop? How do you know? the level that the market yeah. will actually come back into the deal. And your current investors are a little abused by having <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we talk about, right, invest, investment mentality or, or, or thesis in a way. You know, at least for me, I'm betting on the founders. Right? Partially, absolutely, we need to look at the technology, what, what they're solving in the space. That's, you know, equally important, not if... But for me in the past, what I have been most kind of uh, focused on is looking for the founders. I think number one, have they, you know, worked in a crypto company before? I think for me, my background as a, you know, crypto builder, worked in several companies, 
I understand the the deep knowledge in crypto is not going to be you know magically you're going to learn that within a month or two, right? Or even six months. It's going to take a bit of learning curve. Um, and for crypto, the learning curve is just much deeper than traditional tech. That that's my personal feeling. So for me, investing into a founder that has never worked for a crypto company or never, you know, joined a, if they're, they're a developer, like join some kind of crypto projects, it's just a very difficult sell to me, right? So that's the number one thing. And secondly is if they are a serial entrepreneur, right? I know I'm having better confidence in them, right? So they know how fundraising thing works. They know how difficult to, to build and run the company. Um, so typically in the past, these are really the two things I'm looking for from the founders. And we ended up betting I think one of our portfolio companies, uh, called cyber Connect. I was so bullish on them. You know, these are a group of founders. This is their third company. Right? They're, they're Berkeley grads, very young. And this is their, um, you know, actually their second crypto company. They built one in the past. They sold it. This is their second crypto company and being third time founders. So we already got 10 X return on them by far, right? Even if we invested in, you know, within a year. So these are really the, the best founder kind of, um, a team background we're looking for. Well, let's, let's pivot for a moment to, I'll just say your new fund what you're targeting in the new fund, the fact that you have an investment that made 10 X firstly, that's beautiful. And you might say, well, in the go-go days, that's an underperformance, which I'm not going to touch that one, <laughs> but what is it that your new fund is looking to invest in and why? Yeah. Uh, by the way, you know, we're really looking for a hundred X, but, uh, in general, um, I mentioned we are investing into two verticals. One, I call them crypto payments, which is anything, everything related to, you know, transfer basically money from point A to point B using blockchain or crypto. And then the second uh, vertical is uh, general infrastructure to support building a crypto ecosystem. Uh, but I think by far, We've been actually making a small um, kind of reputation or recognition in the crypto VC world as we're purely focusing and doubling down on crypto payments use cases. Um, I think we talked a little bit last, you know, podcast, uh, which what we're really looking for is, um, you know, I'll give you a few examples on the pillar, right? Um, Stablecoin. I think stablecoin is really, you know, probably the, the biggest innovation within crypto uh, to facilitate payments. Right? Initially, it was providing liquidity for traders because they need, you know, to, to not have to access the trade directly to fiat currency. They need the intermediate you know, token to do that. Yeah. But then quickly we realized stablecoin is such a great intermediate for, um, just transacting, you know, money, right? So for us is, I'm looking at a lot of uh, new stable coins on the market. We really believe, you know, the future landscape is gonna be each, um, let's say each country or, or each, you know, fiat currency, they're gonna have a crypto version, right? One-to-one -one packed um, stable coin uh, to pair with them. Or they're going to be, you know, let's already seeing USD, right? Backed. There are several of them on the market, right? USDC, USDT, a bunch of others. Uh, so that's what we really believe, is starting from the table. And then, second, kind of like bigger use cases, or um, we call them on off ramps, is basically supporting how do you move the real world via assets into crypto? And then from crypto, how do you off ramp into traditional? via yeah, assets, you can buy things or move money. Um, and then everything around um, cross-border payments, uh, remittance services, uh, peer-to-peer, and also like e-commerce payments. Right. 
So um, I've seen a lot of companies now are building credit card solutions or debit card. Basically, you know, people are using crypto wallets. How are we going to use that crypto money in the real world? Right? There is sometimes a card to connect either Visa or MasterCard. So other use cases are like payroll, paying people with crypto uh, with tokens that can be stable coin, can be other all kind of tokens you, you, know, you can name. It. And then um, I'm looking at anti-fraud, uh, KYC solution, risk solution for crypto. Um, a funny conversation, right? Um, all the large crypto payment companies out there, I, I talked to several. Um, basically, men, men, basically everyone is building their own risk kind of team, risk factor, right? Anti-fraud, because there's really not a good supplier or provider out there can provide you these kind of, uh, you know, crypto wallet data, on-chain data, uh, identity identity data for crypto. Right? Each company are, are building themselves. To me, there's a huge um, innovation room, right? For, for a lot of small startups can get into the this this space and building solutions. Of course, DeFi is one of the biggest um, verticals that we're also looking into. Let's let's bring it back to something that the audience can relate to. You mentioned payroll. Yeah. So tokenization of payroll. Why is that needed? What's the benefit to an employee that's getting payroll through tokens? Why is why is this an attractive thing to do? Yeah, I think uh, I'll give you some examples, right? So there there were times I have talked to some CFOs or founder of a, of a crypto startups. In the current landscape, many crypto companies actually hire contractors, we call them, or people are, are in different countries because everybody are, are working remote. Um, a lot of crypto companies, right, are working remote. So they, they hire people from different geographic locations. Uh, typically the easier way for them to pay these people are via stable coin, at least right now. Um, so when you think about, right, you have to pay people, uh, you know, a recurring payment and you need a, a platform, right? Let's say compared to traditional one, we're using Gusto or some other ways to pay. Right now in crypto, I haven't heard or seen a very good payroll system to handle this. And really the benefit from, let's say, just using stablecoin to pay you know, your employees, right? Number one, it's just fast payment. You click, um, you know, make a payment, how much money, let's say, you know, a thousand USDC, this money will, you know, instant settle to the other person's account within seconds. Right? The CFO in the past have always told me they want to reduce settlement time typically takes two to three days for bank to do the transfer. So that's basically the most attractive one is reducing settlement time. Um, I think for, for the crypto, right, if you pay other people tokens uh, or stable coin, there's also just a convenience layer uh, because a lot of, I'll give you an example that one of my friends actually runs a node validator. Uh, if people are not familiar, basically is you know you have a lot of engineers run the run on computer to support each blockchain but each computer is sort of considered to be a node and he received payments from the clients are in their local tokens for example right if he runs for uh, polygon they will receive polygon this matic tokens and how they make payroll is he pay people with these tokens they do, he doesn't change to any kind of currency Basically, he needs a layer to conveniently to pay people with native tokens. And um, I, I, I told him, this is what I'm looking for. It's like, sign me up. I, I need this. Right. So I've heard this story many, many times. And uh, it's just a very convenient, faster way for people to, to make payout to their own employees. And Coinbase, a long time ago, have offered to pay people for, like stable, not stable, uh, Bitcoin back then. So there's already, you know, leading crypto companies are doing that. Um, in my opinion, there are going to be more and more companies are paying in crypto in the future. 
right? When there's market, you, you need to provide solution, right? There's a need. Well, clearly people love to get paid sooner than later and the three day lag and having had to deal with that in my businesses prior to this conversation, it's a pain in the neck. And it's, I'll just say negative flow. There's a lot of inefficiencies from both the employee and the employer's perspective. So to me, that solution is what I would call a no brainer. So I, that makes total sense to me. Talk about Oh, this. actually, so, sorry, Mara, I was actually thinking, I'll add one more thing to that quickly. It's actually the programmable kind of aspect of crypto as well. Like you can program it, right? Like when to transfer this token, how much, at what time, right? While I was at Circle, basically, you know, they were building APIs to support these kind of solutions. You can massively transfer money to multiple crypto wallets at a certain time. You just need to put into the program, right? Tell them how much, to whom, which wallet address. It's 100% programmable than the traditional payroll work. No, you're absolutely right. Talk about the gig, the gig economy. So you have basically people like Uber drivers, et cetera. And, you know, a lot of them, it's a, I'll call it a side hustle, not for everybody. People also do it full time. But why is this attractive to the gig economy to have crypto payments? It's, it's super, super attractive. <laughs> so I will say, I, I talked to a founder a while back, right? He's actually building a smaller ride sharing company, uh, rather rather small, right? Uh, the the problem or the benefits he explained to me makes, like they make total sense to me. He said, hey, Tracy, um, I have all these uh, drivers who, who doesn't just drive for me also drive for Uber or Lyft, right? So if I'm able to provide them instant, this payment means every time they took a ride from me, like $15, I can pay them right after the ride within let's say a minute or something. And these people are gonna be so happy to see this $50, 15 immediately in, in their wallet. And they don't have to wait for a whole week to get paid. Uh, I, I, I I think Uber and Lyft was probably paying at least every week. They're definitely not paying every day, right? So for people, you know, a lot of people are, are you know, in the gig economy, they actually need the money. Like they don't want to wait for a week or two weeks. So any small incentive, any small payment, you can make it out to them, really help these people. Uh, so that's the biggest kind of uh, the benefits and the need the founder was, was sharing with me. He wants to be able to make this thing called micro payments to his drivers to compete with the bigger guys. That's just in the U.S., right? No, I totally and, see that. You're, you're squeezing the inefficiency in the system out of the system. So if I'm, I'm just making this up, but if I'm Uber, I'm getting paid from the person who I provided the service of the ride to day one. I, ha I have the ability to hold on to that cash for my own float purposes for a week before I pay the driver. So Uber, in theory, is benefiting from that positive float, whereas the driver is being penalized for the negative float because they provided the service and they haven't been paid yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Uber, Lyft, they're, they're holding on to their, their cash, right, for, for a long period of time before they pay out to these drivers. There, there's it. some incentives on their, their side. Uh, but I will say I've also seen that in emerging markets like, uh, let's say, Southeast Asia or Latin America, even with the right sharing services, a lot of them are still using cash. Uh, even even for like, so, so in Southeast Asia, the most popular one is called Grab. It's the same as Uber over there. And people are still paying cash to take that. You can choose in the app, cash or card. The problem is for these countries, uh, a lot of people just don't have a bank. Right? They're unbanked people. We, we focus our, our investment, we focus a lot actually into the Latin America market. You know, there's, there's roughly 
seventy percent of the people are unbanked people. They don't have a car. They don't have a bank account. They don't have anything, right? Uh, but that's also why crypto has, you know, probably the highest adoption in Latin America compared to anywhere around the world. Really, these crypto payments is providing right a opportunity for unbanked people to get paid. Let me chime in on Latin America because I have my own real life example of why that's the case. But basically, if I simplified things, in many of the Latin American countries, the banks and there's only a handful of banks that dominate the local market. That's first point. Yep. Secondly, the owners of those large banks tend to be one or two of the three most wealthy families in the, that inbound country. Correct. So it's, it's not a competitive marketplace. And the big banks want to have big counterparts they do business with. They're not built, they're not set up to handle retail transactions. So it doesn't surprise me that 70% of the countries and population is unbanked, even though you know, in this day and age, you would think that would be impossible to say, but for the reasons I articulated, that's what's happened. So having an interloper like you're describing on the crypto side to solve that need makes so much sense. And I'll just say, lastly, banks, whether it's in emerging markets or major markets, are really bad about customer acquisition. They're not, they're not set up for it. They're not good at it. Um, they tend to mismanage it. So for all those reasons, the unbanked population at 70% is why it's there. But mm -hmm. what you're describing clearly could be a major catalyst to make these people bankable. And that opens up all kinds of great things in this modern age of you know, financial services and different products and things that these people definitely need and it could be provided to them. Yeah. Oh, 100%. So, you know, speaking of Latin America, uh, the crypto crypto adoption rate is extremely high, I will say. Uh, I think the number is around um, like 50, more than 50 percent of people have actually transferred you know, using crypto to, to make transfer in the past. So I, I actually had a previous partner who, uh, you know, who, who lived in Panama City, right? For them, they are in crypto. So, you know, and, and I, I have some back then employees are in Latin America country as well. So every one of them have a large crypto income, right? So they received tokens. And for them is they need to find a ways to actually use them in the real world, right? By TV, by, you know, groceries. It was such a hard struggle for all of them telling me we need a card solution. We need some kind of solution I can buy with my crypto sitting in my wallet. So um, that's a real struggle. And and they literally sign up every time they if they ever hear a crypto company is launching a card, they want to have you know uh, those cards on hand. And that's why we actually have seen some innovations in the Latin America region. Uh, they're trying to do the all we call them all friend means you have crypto how do you convert to you know local fiat currency to purchase you know, regular goods and, and services uh, so that's another huge area we're quite bullish you know uh, and also we, we think the the dynamic in each country in latin america is, is quite different the government you know the banking system and typically we're looking at a local solution right local builders founders to build for their own country to begin with before they actually can, can do more. Uh, so that's the solution we're looking um, and totally help these people. Well, for lots and lots of reasons, it makes sense for these unbanked people to be banked and all these transactions you're articulating. But think about now, if they're unbanked, that means they're in cash. That means they're walking around with money stuffed under the mattress or in their pocket and God knows what. And that's not the ideal way in the modern economy to transact. So this would literally take them into the future, which is yeah. good for everybody. I, I, 
I know we only have a limited amount of time, so I should have mentioned before we started, if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to put those in the comment box. As, as I say that, I do see a couple questions in here. So let me uh, basically, a gentleman or a gal named JRN says, curious how you think about equity versus tokens and seed deals. Equity versus token. From my perspective as a VC-backed founder, we're seeing VC interest tilt back towards equity as a primary value driver over the tokens. So talk about where the market was versus where it is today, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So to that statement is actually correct. <laughs> I'm seeing a very similar trend uh, that VCs are leaning more towards to equity versus tokens. Uh, before I dive into that, right, maybe I'll just explain a little bit between the equity deals versus the token deals. So the equity is very similar just to traditional, right, what we're seeing in, we call them Web2 investments, uh, right? It's like a, a safe as a seed investment and you go on series ABC uh, with a valuation of the company. For token round, is typically a crypto company that launch a token. And then their valuation is gonna, you know, basically uh, linked to the token price. And the term is slightly different. Early C stage, we, we sign something called a SAFT, S A F T, is a simple agreement for future token. Um, and typically, the 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 invest investment terms are usually we call them have a lockup period. Can be two years, can be three years, and there's a cliff. Could be six months, nine months. So basically, means within this two year lockup period, right after, you can sell 100 percent of of your investment, right, to, to to you know to get liquidity out of that, which is much short, much uh, much much shorter than if you do uh, equity deals, right? Because if you think about equity deals as a traditional, you know, investment. Mostly, you're looking for this company going IPO or this company exit being purchased by another company. This can take, you know, let's say six, eight, ten years, or even longer. That's how you can get your, you know, investment back. But for token investment, theoretically, if your portfolio launching a token, a lockup period is two years, you can get your investment back as soon as that two years ends which is in the past, in the bull market, very, very attractive to a lot of crypto VCs, which you can see why, right? Because shorter return. Um, I guess so what's happening now is on the market, because we see companies valuation, if their token around are tied to their token price. And a lot of times their token price is just not moving up. Right, which means uh, the valuation is not going to go up. The return is has become smaller. And for for a lot of time, it, when I was doing investment, um, especially when I do uh, payments deals, I often ask the founders, like, why do you need a token if they want to have one? You know, the, some of the, some of the times is I want to look at is there any utility of launching a token. You know, what do you want to use this token for? You know, can this actually help your, you know, your business in, in, in a way, help your customers? And often, you know, I got the answers for, we're launching a token because some of our investors want to have a token investment rather than equity, right? To me, for some, you know, payment companies, it really doesn't make any sense. Like, I view these companies as an equity investment deal. If they have a token, you typically valuation, you have to, you have to, you know, uh, match with one, typically it's a token valuation. So you basically drop the equity valuation. So if their token is not being successful, no retail users are buying them. The token price never goes up or goes up, you know, being really flat. You basically don't get a return. Um, I think that's why we see a lot of companies rushing into launching tokens in the past. I think number one is 
actually propped up by a lot of VCs. We call them uh, pump and dump. <laughs> Means these VCs will pump the price of the token and then at the high point, they sell them and really, really hurt the company for the long, you know, for the long term. Um, I actually think the more prominent VCs um, who doesn't really you know, chase these tokens are actually more in the ground at mindset, you know, really looking for, you know, holistically about the company. So that's where we're actually seeing even more founders are aware of this. Uh, there are more being, you know, mind like mindful of does their business actually require a token? Do they need to launch a token? What is the utility of the token? Do they have the right tokenomics right, to distribute the token for the long term? Um, I think that's why we're actually seeing um, the token back company are just not doing great in this term. This is, you know, really created a lot of conversations. Should we actually consider more on equity investment, um, generate better returns versus tokens? Let me, Tracy, try to summarize what I heard you say. Hopefully I got it right. Firstly, tokens early on provided a very quick exit for the VCs who put money in early stage companies, a two-year time horizon to exit versus a traditional time horizon of five years or more, that's, that's very compelling. And the valuations were also very compelling. So those, those, those are good things. Then things like what you call pump and dump. And just so you know, markets move, and these are probably tokens that are thinly traded, so they can be I'll say massaged or manipulated up or down, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So it created a false high expectation of the cryptocurrency's valuation. So the VCs sold to an up market, they got out and they walked away happy. But now the market has matured again, right? We were yeah. talking before about seed investments are more in line with traditional seed investing in the non-crypto world. And I would suggest on the cryptocurrency side, you have a similar phenomenon where pump and dump schemes, thinly traded cryptos are not as appealing or successful as they were previously. Now the market's gotten more savvy. And I, I would call when you have cryptos not moving, I call that dead money because the VCs are there to earn high return. And if the cryptocurrency is not moving, that's dead money for them. That's actually dragging down the results. Correct. So that makes them less interested in owning the cryptocurrency versus the equity. You know, and, and also a lot of companies or founders, they got the idea of they can, you know, get rich sooner or faster by launching tokens, right? Because they, as a founder, they can also sell, get the liquidity out of it. Um, a lot of them are just really not focused on building the company. When you don't have a real or good product, just purely focusing on pumping your token price is really not a good business model, right? Um, for investors, it's just really not a long-term, you know, bet on these kind of companies. And I would say, you know, I, I, I also in the past run like a marketing agency with purely helping projects with crypto to uh, manage basically their, their community, right? crypto communities. Uh, basically, it's a huge, huge, like important element to help, um, you know, tokens to, to go out to the market, to the retail users and for them to buy it. This actually requires a ton, a ton of effort. Uh, you know, several people, full-time team, everybody just manage, every day just manage the community 24 seven, right? 365 days a year. Um, if you have a token, that's how much effort and time you have to put into that to maintain your token price or interest of the, you know, the token holders, which is not really the, not ideal if your business doesn't need a token. No, you're so right. Um, Tracy, we do have another question from the same individual that was asking about the difference between equity versus tokens and early stage financings. So JRN's question is a lot of talk over the last few years that we would get crypto regulation in the U.S., but nothing happened. Uh, 
take out your crystal ball and tell us what you see as a potential regulation of crypto yeah. in 2023. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in, in regulations, uh, but I can just kind of uh, share some of my viewpoints for what I've seen, right, since I was in the space, you know, 2018 till, till now. Um, I think in general, as I kind of mentioned, this industry, this, you know, technology, it's very, very difficult to learn. Uh, it's a lot of nuances and the industry is moving extremely fast. Even for people within, as a professionals, we all kind of <laughs> chuckle and complain to each other, like how much news we're getting every single day, how much you know new things are happening. My overall feeling is the uh, regulators are very slow to re react. Right? Um, you know, these are all kind of <laughs> senior members, or you know, age-wise, uh, they're they're sitting in the Capitol Hill. Uh, you know, for the industry, it's, it's very hard for twenty-year-olds to learn. Let alone you you let you know these regulators to really to learn the nuances of the industry. I think it's just really hard. If you don't have people understand the space, then how are they gonna come up with the really the, the core right regulation to regulate the space? I think it's just challenging. Uh, and also given this the speed of the innovation we're moving, the regulation the, the regulations really need to catch up. For me is you know a, a lot of things happening, right? We're not really regulated in, in so many different areas. By the time, give them a year, two years, three years, they're coming up with regulations. We're moving on to the next, next hot thing in crypto. There are gonna be new things coming up, right? Um, I, it, to me is, I think we covered in the last conversation, I'm very pro regulation. I think really help a lot of people, especially the retail purchasers or retail users. Um, but it's just gonna be a long time. I don't see in the US they're moving fast enough. And in the past, right, we talk about like USDC as, as one of the most prominent stable coins out there. Um, I think, you know, the circle days, um, we see a lot of regulation talking about it, right? And then, or they wanna build CBDC and stuff. We just really don't see concrete bill or anything are coming out. And for innovations, it's, it's, it's hard to just stand still, not moving, <laughs> waiting for the regulations to come out. Uh, so personally, I just I just feel like in the U.S., we better hurry up. You know, we're, we're not doing uh, a great job being the technology leader of the world. It's, to me, it's, it's going to be slow. And then I think the, the founders uh, in, the, in the space will still keep moving, like not waiting. Or they should be mindful of regulation will be coming. Um, but don't stop the train of innovating. Well, I thought that was very well said, and I agree with you. Clearly, regulators cannot keep pace with the speed of innovation in general and in crypto in particular, which is what you've been describing. Mm -hmm. So when, I'll just say, the innovation curve starts to flatten out a little bit, then the regulators can play catch up. But clearly, there's been very little regulation, if any. And how and when we'll start to see that in the U.S., you know, time will tell. That's all I can say. But listen, <laughs> I, I do have to be mindful of the time here, Tracy. And basically, we have two more minutes, and we have a hard stop at 2 o'clock. So I'm going to ask my colleague, Charles, just to advance the slide to the next slide, because we're essentially we're, we're now winding down. All right, Charles, if you'd be kind enough to go to the next slide. Well, in the interest of time, let me just say this. The last slide is the contact information for Tracy and I. And Tracy, would you be kind enough to share with the audience your email uh, address if someone wants to reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's my first name, Tracy, at istari dot ventures so it's our fund name is dot ventures 
And how do you spell Istari? Just so people know that. Is I S T A R I dot ventures. Okay, I think that's a fine place to end today's informative and exciting session. So again, Tracy, uh, really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and comments and keen insights on this fascinating sector of the market. And your fun launch sounds incredibly exciting and compelling. I'm sure you can do great with that. Um, you will be in Denver, I believe, yeah, yeah. at the end of February for a crypto conference. Maybe just end on that, that point, what's happening in Denver and why are you going out there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of my friends are all going to Denver, right? This is considered to be maybe the first major crypto gathering of the year. Uh, it's a developer focused conference, which means they have uh, first week have a hackathon. A lot of developers will go there and, you know, a lot of builders will, will build stuff. And the, the, the second week is more like industry speakers and gathering. Uh, historically, we think that's probably one of the best crypto conferences out there, uh, right? Because a lot of them is, is charging a lot of money, right? This event actually is free. For, for, for a lot of people or maybe for most people. Uh, so developers actually right are very eager to go there, meet people and build stuff. So historically we've have seen better qualities uh, of the deals or means better quality of the founders and startups are, are there. Uh, so that's kind of the reason why we're going. We're also gonna have a private event uh, inviting you know my VC friends and some of the, the founders to to kind of like have an opportunity to meet each other. So um, if anyone is going, you know, I'll see you there in Denver or Pingy. And also, thank you, Mark. Always, you know, warm welcome and very good chatting with you. And trying to, uh, you know, bring you more and more into the crypto world. <laughs> you can say the 21st century, but that's fine. No worries. <laughs> OK, listen, everyone, thank you so much. We're Technically, two minutes above my hard stop at 2 o'clock. But again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next Thursday. And Tracy, wonderful job. And thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>